discuss how stars are born. Good evening. Look up into the night sky and you will see at once that the stars are not all alike. Obviously, they differ in brilliancy. They also differ in colour. For example, look at Arcturus in Boötes the Herdsman. It's orange. Vega in Lyra is blue. And our sun, of course, is yellow. And the sun's a perfectly ordinary star. These differences in colour indicate differences in surface temperature and also in age. We know that the Earth is about 4.6 thousand million years old, and the Sun must be older than that. But going back in time, how were the Sun and other stars formed? And can we see very young stars? And this is why I'm delighted to welcome back Dr. Chris Kitchen, Director of the University of Hertfordshire Observatory. Welcome back, Chris. Thank you, Patrick. Chris, let's go back to very, very early times. Mm -hmm. Why must stars be born at all? Well, in human terms, stars' lifetimes are immensely long, but they aren't infinite, and stars do come to the ends of their lives, sometimes in very spectacular fashions, in supernovae, uh, more often rather more quietly, losing their outer layers to form planetary nebulae, and with the central star collapsing down to form a white dwarf. Now, there are roughly 100,000 million stars in our own Milky Way galaxy. And that's been around for about 10,000 million years. So on a very rough calculation, we should need about 10 stars a year to be born. However, some stars, particularly the hotter ones, uh, go through their lives much more rapidly. Uh, the Sun, for example, uh, is now about halfway through its lifetime of some 10,000 million years. But if we look at a star that is, say, ten times the mass of the Sun, like al Qaeda in Ursa Major, that will go through its lifetime in only a hundred million years. Uh, we therefore need probably around about a hundred stars per year to be born throughout the whole Milky Way galaxy to keep the numbers up to scratch. But there weren't stars being born when the Milky Way galaxy itself came into being? Of course, uh, but any star with a mass like that of the Sun, or more, will have long since gone through its lifetime and disappeared. Only the dull, faint red dwarfs born at the same time as the galaxy will still be around now. And most of the stars we see in the sky have been born more recently. Well, Chris, given the stars are being born, how does it happen? Well, it's the result of a battle. The battle is between gravity and pressure, and it's a battle which pressure has to lose. The interstellar space is not actually a vacuum. It contains around about a million atoms and molecules in each cubic metre. Uh, in some places, it can be thicker than that by up to a factor of a thousand, and we can sometimes see those regions when they're heated by stars as hot glowing nebulae. Uh, now, gravity acts to pull together any pair of atoms, and so there's a constant tendency for such nebulae to become even denser. And that is opposed by the gas pressure, which is trying to push the nebulae out and distribute them throughout the whole of the universe. Now, in the law that we, uh, many of us have learnt in school physics, the perfect gas law, the pressure of a gas is determined by the temperature and by the number of atoms or molecules in each cubic metre. So in regions like the Eagle Nebula, which are hot at 10,000 degrees or more, um, these are too hot already for gravity to cause condensations to, to occur. The equation also tells us that um, the pressure will automatically increase as a cloud collapses. Uh, if a clump of gas halves in size, for example, the gas density, and hence also the pressure, will go up by a factor of eight. Now, the gravitational force will also go up, and Newton's law of gravity tells us that the increase it varies inversely as the square of the separation. So that means when the same clump uh, halves in size, the gravity will increase, but only, in this case, by a factor of four. So how can gravity ever overcome pressure if the pressure rises more quickly? It needs to keep the temperature as low as possible. The conditions for a clump of material to collapse under its own gravitational field were first worked out by Sir James Jeans. And Jean's equation is a complex one, 
and it tells us that for a given temperature and density, there is a certain minimum amount of mass that has to be present in a clump of material before it will collapse. Providing we have more material than that, then it will collapse fairly readily. Then what about our sun? Well, the sun is actually quite small. And at the typical density of an interstellar gas cloud, which is perhaps a million million atoms in a cubic metre, the temperature would have to fall to just a few degrees above absolute zero before masses the size of the sun could collapse out directly. And the density would have to rise a million million times further before masses as small as the Earth could uh, condense out. Um, so it seems likely that the clumps which do start collapsing must be considerably more massive than the Sun, and that they fragment into star-sized bits only later on in the process when their density has increased. And we should therefore expect the births of stars to be multiple ones, with many stars formed in the same region of space at the same sort of time. So what you're saying is that if we put enough material into a small enough space at a low enough temperature, we are bound to end up with a star. Not necessarily. Uh, the crucial factor is not just starting off with a low temperature, but keeping it that way. And that immediately brings us to a problem, because as the clump collapses, uh, energy will be released. In effect, the atoms are falling downhill. And just like something on the Earth rolling down a hill, they will go faster and faster as the collapse proceeds. Uh, in the case of uh, atoms, those faster motions mean higher temperatures. And so as the cloud collapses, the temperature will increase, and so will the pressure, and this will tend to oppose the collapse. Fortunately, there are ways of getting rid of the uh, energy, or we wouldn't be here now to be talking about it. And the main way is by uh, cooling the material, uh, by radiating away energy. To start with, the temperatures are low, so that the energy is radiated away as radio waves. And these can easily penetrate the material of the nebula so allowing the temperature to stay low. Later on, the temperature does rise a little bit, and the energy comes out in the form of microwaves, but the collapse still continues. The crunch point comes when the collapse pushes the density up to a million, million, million atoms per cubic metre. That sounds an awful lot, but in fact it's still quite a low density gas, only a thousand millionth of the density of our Earth's atmosphere. However, at that density, the cloud becomes opaque to the microwave radiation. And so the released energy can no longer escape, and it is trapped and goes into raising the internal temperature. And so the internal pressure also starts to rise. Now, there must be many clouds in which that rise in pressure is sufficient to halt the collapse. And then the cloud, now perhaps only a thousandth of a light year across, will simply sit there only very, very slowly radiating away the energy as it percolates out from the center. So, in fact, if the pressure rises too fast, the star doesn't form at all? Well, not for a very, very long time indeed. Then what happens to enable a star to form? The energy has to go somewhere else other than heating up the gas. And, paradoxically, that requires the gas temperature to rise to something like one and a half to 2,000 degrees. And that's pretty hot. It's as hot as the center of a blast furnace. Um, and at that temperature, the hydrogen molecules, which make up most of the cloud, uh, split into the component hydrogen atoms. Um, this is called dissociation, and it requires a large amount of energy. For a typical gas cloud, the amount of energy that the sun would radiate over a period of 10,000 years. Uh, if the cloud is still collapsing, then, when its temperature reaches 2,000 degrees, uh, it will continue to collapse with the potential energy that's being released going into dissociating the hydrogen molecules. Now, there's a lot of hydrogen in an interstellar gas cloud, but eventually most of it will become dissociated. And then the cloud will be collapsing rapidly, and the central temperature will shoot up, uh, this time to something like 5,000 degrees. And that is getting quite hot, mm. almost as hot as the surface of our own sun. And at that temperature, the potential energy can be mopped up by ionizing the hydrogen. That is, splitting the uh, hydrogen atoms into their component protons and electrons. And that also requires a lot of energy, in fact, about six times as much as dissociating the molecules. Later on, still in the, sta in, in the process, the helium, which forms a small part of the nebula, will also become ionized and mop up more of the energy. 
At the end of all these stages, we'll be left with the centre of the cloud collapsed down to something a few times the present size of the sun, uh, the central temperature shooting up towards a million degrees, and with the pressure finally rising sufficiently to halt the collapse. And we can now think of the central region as a protostar, that is to say an embryonic yes. star, uh, rather than as just a thick part of the gas cloud. The inner parts of the cloud collapse much faster than the outer parts, so once the protostar has formed, uh, the continuing collapse of the outer parts will add to its mass and cause a slow shrinkage down to its final size. That infalling material uh, will also release energy as it hits the surface of the protostar, uh, making it very many times the brightness of the sun, although most of the energy coming off in the infrared region. What turns a protostar into a real star? Well, I think of a star as being born when the nuclear reactions start in its interior, and they will begin as the temperature rises towards the million degrees. But not initially. The hydrogen to helium reactions which power uh, most of the stars that we see in the sky. The protostar will contain small quantities of heavy hydrogen, that is deuterium, and lithium, and they react at much lower temperatures than normal hydrogen. Um, so to start with, the deuterium and lithium uh, will react uh, in what is actually the reaction that occurs in what we call hydrogen bombs on the Earth. Yes. And those reactions will raise the central temperature towards the 10 million degrees or so that is needed to start the direct reaction of hydrogen nuclei. We can picture the changes to the protostar on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, with the main sequence going from the top left down to the bottom right, and the protostar down in the bottom right-hand corner to start with. Um, it comes across diagonally as its temperature and luminosity increase uh, above its final place on the main sequence because of the high luminosity from the infalling matter. It stabilizes and then moves down towards its place on the main sequence. The start of the nuclear reactions, the actual birth of the star, will occur around about the apex of that path. So that's the theory. Well now, Chris, can we actually see any of this happening? There are two problems with that, and the first is that although some of the stages happen quite quickly on an astronomical time scale, it still takes many hundreds of, lifeti of human lifetimes to occur. We cannot therefore watch a single star going through the whole process. But what we can do is watch many stars and protostars at different stages and try and link them together to our theories. Point taken. Now, what about the second problem? Second problem is that the birth of stars occurs deep inside interstellar gas clouds. And the gas, more importantly the dust, hides most of that process from direct observations. But there are some things that we can see, and the earliest stages occur in the giant molecular clouds. Uh, these are only observed at radio wavelengths from the emissions from the molecules within them, and they are huge. Uh, some of them can be as much as 300 light years across and contain thousands of times the mass of the sun. Within them are smaller, dense cores, perhaps a light year or so across, and containing a few times the mass of the sun, with temperatures down to 10 degrees Kelvin. And these are probably just about at the start of the collapse process. The giant molecular clouds themselves and their origin is still something of a mystery. But it may be that explosions at the centre of our own galaxy, uh, somewhat like those occurring in Seyfert galaxies, may cause concentrations of the interstellar material uh, through magnetic interactions. We can also see what may be early stages in the collapse process when these little bits of material are silhouetted against bright nebulae. The gas and the dust cause these objects to appear dark, and they're called Bok globules. Uh, most of the later stages are, of the formation are hidden by the gas and dust, um, but there are some infrared sources which are thought perhaps to be at the stage when the outer parts of the collapse are colliding with the surface of the protostar. And in these cases, we can sometimes see round the corner in order to uh, improve our observations. How on earth can you do that? Well, we have to observe the scattered light. Uh, most interstellar clouds are rotating slowly. And as they collapse, that rotation is conserved, 
and they become flattened by centrifugal forces. The polar regions are therefore much clearer of gas and dust than the equatorial regions, and the infrared light can get out more easily along the polar directions. Uh, some of it will then be scattered towards us by the material in the outer parts of the nebula. And uh, when we see it, that scattered light will be mixed up with light that has been emitted directly from the outer parts of the nebula. And we need, therefore, to separate out the two components. Luckily, the scattering polarizes the light, whereas directly emitted light is not polarized. So if we use a polarimeter to observe these infrared sources, then we can separate out the polarized component, which is the scattered light, which is coming from the protostar, and, as I say, we see around the corner. Highly ingenious. Well, are there any other parts of the birth we can see directly? Not really, although there are one or two associated uh, events. For example, later on, a strong stellar wind develops, uh, but because of the material around the equator, it can only come out along the poles, and it does so in the form of jets. When those jets interact with the remains of the gas cloud, we get faint glowing regions known as herbig hero objects. Even later on, um, after the star has been born, uh, it passes through an unstable phase uh, before settling down onto the main sequence. Uh, that stage we see as the T Tauri stars. Uh, these are irregular variables which appear just above the main sequence uh, and are often still embedded in the remains of the gas cloud. Even later on still, we can see the results of many stars being born as the uh, galactic clusters such as the Pleiades here. Well, we've been talking about the birth of stars. Now, what about planets, Chris? Where do they come in? Planets are more difficult and it's not at all clear. They may form um, in the early collapse of the dense cores in the molec giant molecular clouds, or later on in the thick accretion disk which forms around the protostar, or even later on as that disk evaporates. There are, however, several indirect lines of evidence um, which suggest that planetary systems should actually be quite common. And we have, for example, the possible pre-planetary disk around Beta Pictoris. Well, I wonder. Well, looking into the far future now, Chris, is there going to come a time when no stars are going to be born? I'm afraid so. Eventually, the gas and dust in the galaxy are going to be used up, and then we'll just be left with the existing stars, which will go through their lives and eventually leave the galaxy populated just with their dying embers. That sounds rather extreme, doesn't it? I'm afraid it does, but fortunately it's a long time in the future, something like 10,000 times the present age of the universe, so it's not going to worry us very much. So at least we on Earth have a long time to go. Indeed. Chris, thank you very much. Thank you. So you can see that although we don't claim to know the entire story of the life history of a star, we've come a long way, and we now do have a very good idea of the way in which stars are born. And when you look up into the sky, you'll realize that all these stars have characteristics of their own, and our sun is a perfectly ordinary star. And like all the others, a long time ago, it too was born inside a nebula in the way we've been discussing. So, in our next program, I'll begin to go very much nearer home. At the moment, we're going through a very interesting time. We are going through the plane of Saturn's rings. And so for our next program, we're going to talk about that. And meanwhile, don't forget, if you want the latest information, you can call the Sky at Night Information Line, 0891 800 or you can dial up CFAX, page 615. And so, until next month, good night.